pleasure to introduce our next speakers before the break, Hannah Murray and John Fuller, who will discuss the UK experience of patient and, pub, uh, and public partners in research prioritization. Hannah Murray is the Patient and Public Involvement and Engagement Lead for the Blood and Transplant Research Unit in Organ Donation and Transplantation at Cambridge and Newcastle Universities in the UK. She's responsible for ensuring the patient public voice is at the heart of their research activities, and her main responsibility is to support the unit's patient and public research panel. Uh, John Fuller has been a member of the Blood and Transplant Research Unit in Organ Donation and Transplantation in the UK for a number of years. As the carer of a heart transplant recipient, uh, John has a wealth of knowledge and experience, which has enriched not only the unit's research, but also its educational communication and engagement activities. So I'll pass it off to you, Hannah and John. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Like Caroline, I will start my timer and share my screen. Can everybody see that okay? Perfect. Okay. Great, thank you so much. So thank you and uh, merci for the lovely introduction. Um, it is really wonderful to be here to talk to you a bit about our experiences within the BTRU. Um, so hello everyone, um, I am Hannah Murray and I'm the PPIE lead. I'm joined of course by my lovely colleague, John Fuller. And today we're gonna to be looking at patient and public partners in research prioritization. We're gonna be looking a bit more about the experiences that we've had within the BTRU and OTT. So to look a bit about uh, content, we're going to be discussing, well, providing an introduction to the BTRU in ODT, what is it um, and what is its purpose. We're going to be looking at the PPI activities uh, within the BTRU. Um, we developed a five-year strategy, and I'll talk uh, briefly about that. Um, we'll also talk about our patient and public research panel um, and the activities that, are, that are, um, panel members can be involved in. And we'll also talk a little bit about our engagement and how it is that we go out into communities and talk about what it is that we're doing within the BTRU. So to begin with, what is the BTRU in OTT? There is a lot of acronyms, which I apologize for, that it seems to be something part of the role is that we come across so many acronyms. But a BTRU, it stands for a Blood and Transplant Research Unit. Um, there are currently five BTRUs um, within, the UK, within England. Um, these are units which undertake research to improve the supply of blood, blood products, stem cells, tissues, and organs for transplantation. Um, we are funded by an organization called the National Institute for Health and Social Care Research and we work in partnership with the NHS Blood and Transfer, the NHS being the National Health Service of course. Um, the first unit was um, developed back in 2015 and that run for five years. We then applied for a further um, batch of funding and were funded for another five years um, from 2022 to 2027. So it, as I say, it's a collaboration uh, between Newcastle University and the University of Cambridge and NHS Blood and Transplant. Um, the BRTU, BTRU offers infrastructure and expertise across a range of research areas, um, and these include do donor organ optimization, machine perfusion of whole organs, uh, advanced therapeutics, and post-transplant outcomes. Uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, we're divided into six research themes, the majority of which are lab-based. Um, research uh, theme six is um, looking at more kind of qual um, qualitative research in um, inequalities. Um, and the overarching aim is to increase the number of organs available to improve long-term outcomes and quality of life for patients. That's hugely important. Um, we also want to identify those who are not best served by services and to improve access to transplantation, examining um, inequalities and what the barriers are uh, to receiving a transplant and how these may be overcome through different uh, bits of research. So what does PPIE look like within the BTRU? Um, I think just to say as well, in terms of language, I think if for this presentation, I think involve, if you're not familiar with involvement, I think involvement is very, it is co-design, I think effectively. But within the BTRU, PPIE is involvement, engagement is at the heart of our activities. It's not just about our research. And the idea behind my role is to bring the public and researchers together. And we don't just do that in one way. There are a few ways that we do that. And I'll talk about those in a moment. We've developed a five-year PPIE strategy. 
which outlines all our activity for those five years, um, which was recently approved by our funder. Our funder was very generous. They offered uh, no comments for improvements, which I think is a good sign. Um, and it's now published and available on our website. And the strategy is based around the UK standards for public involvement. Now, I'm not sure if you are familiar with these standards, but basically they offer a framework, a way in which you can plan your PPIE activities or more of your involvement activities within your research. And these are split between six different standards. So you've got communications, working together, inclusive opportunities, impact, governments, governance, and support and learning. Um, and the idea is that we we use these to determine what we're going to do around PPIE, but we also want to develop training for our, um, our researchers and also our public contributors um, so they get an idea of not just what the policy is, what it says on paper, but also how to put that into practice. And the idea behind the training is to learn from those who have been involved in research for some time and uh, develop, develop ideas on what is good practice and what the challenges may be. So these are just a couple of um, shots from our PPIE strategy. As I say, it's for over the course of five years, the entire lifespan of the unit. Um, it's 19 pages long, so it's incredibly thorough. It was um, written in collaboration with our panel, with our public co-applicants, um, with other BTRU colleagues, our colleagues, our directors, our researchers. And it basically outlines our vision, our goals, what it is that we hope to achieve. But it also reflects on the challenges um, we exper experienced within the previous BTRU. Um, and we outline how it is that we intend to grow and develop and what lessons have been learned for those, um, those challenges. And if anyone wishes to read that, um, as I say, it's 19 pages, but it is available on our website. So what is the BTRU in ODT patient and public research panel? Now, the panel was established back in 2015. Um, we currently have 14 members. And the idea is um, the sort of the main purpose for the, the panel, I suppose you could say, is that we come together and we meet with one or two researchers and we talk about what it is that, you know, that they want to do, whether that's an idea for a clinical trial, um, an application that they, they're going to submit, um, or it could just be an initial idea. It could just be, you know, this is what I've been thinking about. What do you think? What do you think the public or patient's perception of this particular idea is going to be? Um, we like to prepare our members, so we send them documentation in advance, at least two weeks ahead of the meeting, which outlines in plain English what the researcher intends to do, if they have any questions, what the goal is, what the reasoning is behind the, uh, the research. And this helps us to, once the panel meeting takes place, we have the researcher present again in plain English to the panel. And then for the rest of the time, probably about 40 minutes or so, um, the, it's an open forum. So the panel can ask questions, they can make comments. Um, and we want people to be as honest as possible, um, obviously being um, constructive in their criticism, but um, to, to be honest with the researchers and say, this isn't gonna work, try it like this. It's the only way that obviously the researchers will get an honest view of what it is that they're trying to achieve. Um, we're currently trying to increase our diversity to better reflect the patient population, um, making sure we have members from all ethnic backgrounds, from all ages, from all locations. Um, it's incredibly important, I think, as well for inequalities. If, say, for example, you are from um, uh, an ethnic minority background, or you perhaps live in a rural location and don't necessarily have access um, or um, sort of reliable access to maybe transport or, and healthcare. Are you supported, you know, once you've had a transplant? Is your quality of life affected because you live in that rural location? We try to make our meetings as accessible as possible. There's not just one way to get involved. So all of our meetings are online. Um, this was something that happened during the COVID um, sort of lockdowns that we had. Everything was moved online. Um, it was also a way to keep um, our patient uh, panel members um, safe. Obviously, they can be immunocompromised, and we wanted we didn't want anyone to to have to go through an adverse risk just to come along to one of our meetings. Um, people can also our well, panel members can also submit their feedback via email if they wish um, or they can put something in a the chat there doesn't necessarily have to be them talking uh, with our pan other panel members um, we have payment available we offer payment to our panel members in line with um, our funders guidance and we meet monthly we've actually had to increase uh, the, the amount of panel meetings that we have because demand has has risen from our researchers i'd like now I'd like to hand things over to john who's going to talk about um his perspective as a panel member, what, what, what brought him to the research panel?
Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, and uh, it's nice to be with you today, uh, all today. Uh, I joined the panel fairly early on when it first started. I uh, was at an outpatient uh, with my wife, who is the uh, recipient, and she uh, went, was going very regularly then. And there was a medical student who asked uh, if they could interview me with regard to uh, the work they were doing. So I did their interview and uh, didn't think any more of it. But a few months later, I was contacted by Newcastle uh, University and asked if I'd like to join this patient and public involvement group. Um, I thought it was a good idea. Not only was I interested in uh, what the research might be, but I also uh, felt that it was a way of saying thank you for my wife getting the transplant. Uh, as you probably know, in the UK, the NHS, National Health Service, is funded out of general tax and taxation. You don't pay anything when you go into hospital. It's it's all free at the point of, uh, of receiving medical attention. So this was a way of saying thank you and uh, and I continue to be a member of the panel ever since. The, at first, it seemed that researchers were sort of ticking boxes. They had to talk to us. It was, it was necessary for them to get funding and uh, um, they uh, weren't going any further than that. Uh, but I think they soon realized that we could be very useful in our background knowledge. So we have seen increased feedback coming from the researchers, them coming back to us and asking more questions. And as time has gone on, this has built up quite a lot. And even to the point where the theme six that Hannah mentioned, which deals with post-transplant patients and the issues that they have uh, and things that could be done to improve their post-transplant lives came in to the recent funding. And I'm very pleased about that. My wife has suffered problems mainly due to the immunosuppression drugs and uh, maybe she won't benefit from it, uh, but as things are going on, there is, two main things being looked at at the moment and these could help future patients to have less immunosuppression uh, and maybe not suffer the problems of my wife. Uh, I hope to be able to continue being a panel member for many years to come. I'm still in good health myself so uh, um, I'm hoping I'll be able to continue. Uh, any questions, ask me later. Thank you. Back to you, Hannah. Thank you so much, John. I'll, uh, I'll share my screen again. Okay, so this is just a, gives you a little bit more of an idea about what our panel members um, are actually involved in. It's not just um, being part of the panel. There are lots of other things that you can do. Um, so um, you can be a public co-applicant, which basically means um, you can have, you can be involved in specific research projects and have um, an area of responsibility, something that you're um, sort of, which is built into the project. So you could be responsible for dissemination, for helping to design the clinical trial or any, anything like that. It's taking on a, a kind of further additional role within research. Um, communication, our panel members have helped us to write blog posts, newsletters, social media posts, information for our website. Um, there are so many ways to kind of communicate with the wider patient, with the patient population. And our panel members are very good at doing that. Um, researcher training. Um, a few weeks ago, we had a researcher training event um, where we brought our trainees. It seems silly to call them trainees because they're, they're absolutely brilliant at what they do, but um, they um, were brought together with our with members of our panel. And there were some presentations. There was a wonderful keynote, but the, the kind of the biggest part of the day was having uh, roundtable discussions. And these were opportunities for little groups of researchers, of 
surgeons of um, lab techs and, and everybody in between to speak one-to-one -one with researchers and talk about what motivates them, the reasons why they're involved in research, um, you know, what the patient perspective is on certain aspects. And it was a really enlightening day. It was really wonderful. You got to speak about well-being, about, um, you know, so many different things. And I think there's not many of those opportunities in there. A lot of our researchers are a bit lab based. They are in the lab all the time. They don't get a lot of opportunity to go out and engage with the patients, with the public. So this was a great opportunity for them, I feel. Um, education, we um, have a master's uh, in research uh, in transplantation in Newcastle University and our panel members help us to shape um, our PPIE lecture. It's three hours long and in the beginning it was just me talking for three hours, which obviously isn't very interesting. So now we've designed a session which is me talking a little bit and then a lot of discussion, questions, activity. It's a lot more dynamic and I think it's a lot more engaging and interesting. And what's funny is our students did say, did say um, in the feedback that this was one of the few opportunities they had to actually meet patients and carers in the public. So again, this is a really good way um, of getting to speak to researchers at an early stage and emphasize the importance of PPIE. Our panel members also help us with engagement. Um, they come along to events, they give us some ideas on what we should be doing. Um, so it's a really wonderful way to, to get more involved in our activity and also dissemination. They talk about us, which is really wonderful because I think a lot of the time, the VTRU isn't necessarily something that people are aware of. So I think being able to talk about it with family and friends is, is really important. Okay. So in terms of research prioritization, um, ideally we would want PPIE to begin at the very earliest stages, you know, at that first spark of an idea. Um, but that can be very challenging to do. And Sandra and Caroline have mentioned some of the challenges that are faced when trying to do that. As you know, there are short deadlines for funding applications. Um, you know, you may all of a sudden realize, oh, this pot of money has become available and you only have two weeks to submit your application. How can you develop a PPI strategy and make those connections with communities that you want to speak to in that time? It's just not physically possible. Um, how do you connect researchers and public and patients and carers? These relationships, take time as we've said it isn't just about dropping in and taking what you need and going it's about developing relationships over the long term and another part of that is how you maintain the link if you are unsuccessful in your funding bid how do you manage to keep that relationship going um you know how do you um find the resources to be able to manage that um researchers need support i think there is a lot of information out there in terms of guidance but not necessarily always on how to put that into practice and how it can be transposed i guess into you know into different specific areas of research. So it's important that researchers feel um, empowered and they feel confident because without that, they, they, just, not, they just aren't going to um, engage with PPIE. Um, again, meaningful involvement. It shouldn't be transactional. This is not a tick box exercise. You should really want to um, find you know, the right people to be involved in your project. But again, how do you do that if you have such short time, if you don't necessarily have the funding? And PPI funding to make those initial connections does require money um, in, and the time you have to be able to go out to, to create those events, to cater them, to, you know, to have you know, fully stocked resources. And it's not necessarily always possible to do that if you don't have that initial funding. So in terms of what we've been doing within the BTRU, um, our panel members worked with us to develop and write the bid for further funding that we submitted back in 2021. Um, they helped us to steer research priorities. So as John has described, looking at um, life post-transplant and immunosuppression, a lot of the discussion we've had recently about um, uh, within our panel is, you know, if we didn't have the immunosuppression, if we didn't have to take all these um, medicines, then a lot of the problems we experienced wouldn't necessarily exist. So again, the, uh, them sharing that information with us is helping to guide and steer the way we move in terms of our research. Um, the research, researchers meet with the panel as early as possible, and we try to re-emphasize that point as much as we possibly can. Whenever we meet with our tra with our trainees or any of our researchers, um, we're saying conversations must must happen from the earliest stages to create relevant and impactful research. And I feel like the more we say that, the more likely that message is to get across. Um, in terms of our um, education and training activities, again, they reinforce that message. It should begin as early as possible, um, and they can see firsthand the importance of the patient and public voice. Um, our co-applicant, who's actually here today, Sean, um, she um, 
comes along to our unit meetings and she gives short presentations that highlight the important aspects um, and she has emphasized the need for early involvement and I think that message is beginning to kind of break through to our researchers um, and like I say we need to support our researchers to, research to embrace PPIE through training and support without that they're not going to be able to do it. I can just um, jump in real quick we're just we're real tight for time so if we can I on, apologize that okay that's okay yes of, yes of course I will I will I won't talk about engagement. I apologize. I'll just end here. Um, so we're also looking at measuring and assessing impact. Um, we want to reflect and grow what's working, what isn't. And we make sure we try and have um, an entire policy around that and implement that as effectively as we can. Also, what's really important, um, well-being. If you are discussing incredibly difficult moments in someone's life, um, you know, why they came to um to need a transplant or things like that, that can be really difficult. And we have to make sure that everyone feels supported and able to, do, able to talk about those things and that their well-being, their mental health is considered. So I will stop there because I'm out of time, but um, if anyone would like to learn a little bit more about our engagement and where you can find more information, um, please do feel free to get in contact with me. I'm always very happy to help everyone. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Hannah and John. Sorry to cut you off there. It would have been great to be able to have the time to, to finish off that. Um, so uh, again, we have a little bit of time for Q&A. Uh, so feel free to ask questions in the panel using the chat box, uh, raise your virtual hand, um, or uh, send a message directly to the CDTRP Q&A user in the chat box. Um, any questions from anybody at the moment? None yet, maybe. Oh, Caroline? Oops. Sorry, I can't seem to turn my camera on, but um, thank you. That was a, a, a wonderful presentation. And uh, and I have a question um, that might be, I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what to do with this question. So um, oftentimes in engagement with patients, you're engaging patients who've had positive experiences. And John, you talked a little bit about your wife's experience, and I think that's really interesting about how her experience, which wasn't maybe all positive, is could inform other patients. Um, but in the engagement, um, I, I find that sometimes the patients that I see in this area, not only Indigenous, but others, are patients where things have gone really, really well, right? Um, and that... Um, do you have patients in a context where things didn't go well? So for instance, a donation, a living donation happens. We have a case in, in Canada, a living donation happens and the, the patient passes away. And, and the experience of that person is very different than it is for other people. And so, so how does that play into, uh, how does that play out in the context that you're in? And is that a patient group that, or a family group that, that, that isn't engaged with as much or are more difficult or should be engaged with in different ways and have different roles? Thank you, Caroline. Um, yes, I mean, our, our current panel um, is a wonderful mixture of, we have um, a living donor, we have someone whose child required um, a double kidney transplant when they were very young. Um, we have carers of transplant recipients. Um, we have people who've experienced very serious illness, members of the public who have cared for someone who has sadly passed away. Um, and it, it's, it's that wonderful breadth of experience that really um, informs what it is that we do. Um, I think you are right. I think we do need to maybe engage a bit more with people who have a negative um, experience. I think some of the discussion that we've had recently, like to say about the immunosuppression, people are, aren't holding back and saying, this is what I experienced. This is, you know, this is not a great quality of life because I have, you know, a raised uh, risk of getting skin cancer or I have, I have water retention. So those discussions are very honest, but I think, I think as well, we maybe perhaps have to, in our engagement, we tend to engage with the public. So if we're going, if we're going to focus our program and go directly to patients, I think we do need to be very mindful that not everybody has that same experience. You might think, oh, everybody who has a heart transplant experiences it the same way, and that's just simply not the case. Uh, John, did you want to say something? Yes, I, I would add that um, 
some years back now when we were meeting in person we were at a meeting that had a lot of uh, professionals and when we mentioned uh there was two or three of us that specifically mentioned quality of life they seemed shocked uh they seemed to think that we are, you've had the transplant you're alive what more do you want um, and uh, we pointed out the, the problems that can occur. And since then, they have started to take more notice of us. That was just the beginning, but it's moved on quite a bit from there. OK. Thank you, Johnny. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Yes, thank you for the question, Caroline. Thank you, Hannah, Hannah and John for the answer on there. Um, we've got about three minutes left. Any other questions uh, that we would like to, to pass on? Uh, yeah, Sandra, please. Yeah, John, thanks for bringing up a really good point. So I'm the theme lead on long-term outcomes for patients, transplant patients. And one of the things is, is it sounds like you get the similar experience in UK that we have here is that our clinicians look at us and make sure like our blood work is good and our you know, if you have a liver, your liver number is the ones in that. But, you know, you walk out of the office and they're telling you you're great, but you're like, I'm not sleeping. You know, my, my diet's changed. I don't feel like eating. I'm depressed. But how can I bring that up? Because I should be glad I got a transplant. So we're really trying to use um, at both our main hospitals here in Toronto, PROMS, patient reported outcome measurements, and PRAMS to be able to determine you know, what, what a patient feels is important during the clinician. So it helps set the, 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 um, the visit to deal with those kind of things. So the patient's able to do it from home or on a machine. And so they put it there so they don't have to really like talk about it. Pain management is another thing as well. So I'm really hoping to see that kind of, uh, it's a research program. We're really seeing, hoping to see that get uh, implemented across all all of our uh, clinicians, uh, clinic, transplant clinics within uh, within Canada. So I wanted to share that with you. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. thanks very much. Um, it, one of the things we are promoting in the uh, panel is to get patient, po patients post-transplant um, to talk about their problems or no problems, because some of them don't have problems, but get across the board um, interviewing patients to find out if they've got problems and what they are, so that the professionals do know what they're up against. Because you're right, they, they, they don't really want to know in clinic, I don't think. They just, uh, they just check your bloods and so forth, ask you if you're all right, and on to the next patient almost. They're, they're not quite that bad, but it's it's getting that way. No, but that's when we have to count on our live health and our primary care uh, providers. And I think, I really think like empowering our primary care providers, like, you know, we've come a long way. I've had my liver for 26 mm -hmm. years and I was my only doctor's patient that had a transplant, you know, and she was given a manual and everything. It can be overwhelming, but the more that we work with primary care doctors because we don't want patients coming down to the clin cl clinics for everything, but we want those doctors to realize that we're more than just our organ. It's a more holistic approach, but whatever part of the, whoever's part of the care team that helps with that, right? So it can't all be on them, but they have to at least guide and direct us to the right care. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that final question, Sandra.